Good morning and happy Independence Day. I'm Randall Wilkins, one of the pastors at Bethany Covenant Church, and I'm so happy to be with you today on this 4th of July Sunday. The 4th of July doesn't occur on Sunday very often. In fact, the last time it would have happened, uh, Independence Day Sunday got skipped because of leap year. But when I think about the 4th of July on Sunday, it brings to mind our nation's bicentennial in 1976, when Independence Day did happen to be on a Sunday. I was 15 years old, just about to turn 16, and I remember the day of the bicentennial very well. I remember going to church that morning, not in Kansas, where I lived in my growing up years, but in Cedro Woolley, where we were on vacation that summer. And I remember standing with a huge crowd of Skagit Valley residents that evening, watching the fireworks as part of the bicentennial celebration. My family vacationed in Washington that summer, not just because it was the bicentennial, and not just to visit some of my mom's relatives and her childhood friends who lived here, but also because my folks had just attended the Covenant Annual Meeting in Tacoma, where they were delegates. It was a significant annual meeting that year because it was the one where they first voted to ordain women to be pastors in our denomination. My folks aren't still around to ask, but I'm pretty sure that they were among the majority of delegates who voted for women's ordination in that annual meeting. By the way, they would have also voted for the ordination of Pastor Dwight that year, if I'm not mistaken. Bethany Covenant Church has benefited greatly from that vote to ordain women at the Tacoma Annual Meeting. In the 15 years I've served our church, I've been blessed and honored to work aside, alongside my colleagues, Vic, Pastor Vicki Lund, Pastor Britta Berger, and Pastor Sally Carlson. Pastor Sally, sadly, will be departing from us this week. I know I'm going to miss working with Sally, and our church won't be the same without her collegiality, her encouraging smile, the rich experience she has brought us from the denomination and from pastoral ministry and other places, and her much-needed perspective as a woman of color. I know we will all miss Pastor Sally, and I've heard that expressed by so many of you. But even as we're sad to lose Pastor Sally from our staff, there's another loss we haven't talked about quite as much. When we come back to church a week from today, we will, be, we, we will be without a woman on our pastoral staff for basically the first time this century. And that's a significant loss for us as a church, a loss we should all deeply grieve. That 1976 vote for women to be ordained as pastors in our denomination proclaimed that for the first time, half of our members who had been previously excluded from ministry were finally free to respond to God's call. But that message of freedom has not always been universally received or welcome. Nor have the freedoms we prize so highly in our country been equally offered to all through our nation's history. Freedom was clearly not guaranteed for Africans who were stolen from their homeland and enslaved. Freedom was clearly not a right offered Native Americans who were driven off their land and worse. And we as a nation continue to wrestle with the implication of these sins of our past that refuse to just stay in our past. And it's not just our nation. All of humanity throughout history really has had a dubious track record when it comes to upholding the value of freedom. It's true of governments, and it's true of churches. It certainly was true of several of the churches the Apostle Paul wrote his letters to. Paul teaches about freedom in Christ very, very clearly in the books of Romans, First and Second Corinthians, Galatians, and Colossians, and he refers to it in his other letters as well. Freedom is clearly a major theme with Paul, one he emphasizes because he believes it to be a major attribute of the Christian life. If we are in Christ, we are no longer under the law, but we are set free by his grace. 
We'll be hearing more about freedom in Christ from Pastor Ken Wagner as part of our August series on the Covenant Affirmations, so I don't want to steal his thunder. But I do think this concept of freedom in Christ bears repeating. I think we can stand to hear more than one sermon this summer about freedom in Christ. And it's something very fitting for us to consider on this day that we call Independence Day. So we're going to take a look at one of Paul's teachings about freedom in Christ. Colossians 2, verses 16 through 23. As I read these words, feel free to read along in your Bible. Colossians 2, 16 through 23. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink, or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. Do not let anyone who delights in false humil humility and the worship of angels disqualify you. Such a person also goes into great detail about what they have seen. They are puffed up with idle notions by their unspiritual mind. They have lost connection with the head, from whom the whole body, supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows as God causes it to grow. Since you died with Christ to the elemental spiritual forces of this world, why? As though you still belong to the world, do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These rules, which have, not, have, have to do with things that are all destined to perish with use, are based on merely human commands and teachings. Such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility, and their harsh treatment of the body, but they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. Now, in background to this scripture, there, there are some helpful things about the Colossian church that it would be good to know. Colossae had been a very significant city for trade and culture, and culture for several centuries, but by Paul's time, it had declined and dwindled in importance. Regardless of that decline, there was a church there a church that Paul never visited, but one that he cared about because of his friendship with Epaphras, a Colossian man who had come to faith in Christ and had carried the gospel back to his native town. Like many Jewish and Christian communities scattered in cities throughout the Roman Empire, Colossae was far removed from, geographically from the influence of Jerusalem. And so the Colossians were tempted, just like many such faith communities, to adapt some of the religious and philosophical ideas that surrounded them, ideas that were not necessarily compatible with Christianity. Paul seems to be confronting some of these ideas. For instance, he may have been addressing an extreme kind of Christian Judaism that was attaching a bunch of extra rules to the gospel, kind of like the extra rules that were practiced by the Jews at Qumran. Then there are these phrases Paul quotes in, in verse 21. Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These commands probably come from a, a kind of pagan asceticism, a practice of severe self-discipline and self-denial that had gained pop popularity in the surrounding Greco-Roman culture. There also seems to have been a cult in Colossae that venerated angels particularly the archangel Michael, who is said to have caused the healing spring to gush from a fissure in the earth. That very well could have been what Paul was referring to when he mentions the worship of angels in verse 18. And this attention to angels also seems to have gone hand in hand with a kind of pseudo-spiritualism, a spiritualism that would much rather pay attention to heavenly beings than to the harsh realities of earthly being. It would seem that what Paul was addressing here was one of the early roots of Gnosticism. Gnosticism would eventually be branded as heresy by the church in the second century. The Gnostics taught that physical matter is evil, 
that the world is ruled by a second lesser God and that you could only be redeemed by special knowledge of spiritual mysteries. This special knowledge or gnosis is where the term Gnosticism comes from. Well, Gnosticism did not fully emerge until the century after Paul. He's already dealing with the beginnings of it right here in the Colossian church. And in one way or another, We've been fighting Gnostic tendencies in the church ever since. If we consider again what the word Gnostic means, this idea of special knowledge, we will recognize that it isn't limited to Gnosticism as a second century movement. Gnostic thinking is kind of like being a member of an exclusive private club, a spiritual club. If you have a, a Gnostic outlook on faith and religion, you look around at other people and say, they don't know the special things I know. They don't have the special knowledge I have. They're not as spiritual as I am. We see this kind of attitude in certain religious groups today. This idea that they are the ones who have the special knowledge. That they're the, the, the truly spiritual ones. That they know the right way to think and act on religion. And that all these other folks who call themselves Christians, but don't align to their rules and ideas, are simply in error. But this is just a kind of arrogant Christian extremism. Even streams of teaching within Christianity that would otherwise be considered orthodox and mainstream can assume a Gnostic quality when taken to extreme. This is where we get denominations that say we're the only ones who are saved. We're the only ones who are going to heaven. We're the only ones who have the right way to interpret scripture. I think we can see how easily this happens. I mean, we're all human beings. I think we all have this tendency in us to some degree. People find a certain teaching or approach to life that is helpful. So they turn it into a nice little rule, and that may good, be good for them. And if one rule is helpful, even more rules will be even more helpful, right? So they make more rules. And if those rules are helpful to me, they'll be helpful to other people as well, right? So they impose their rules on other people, expecting them to follow their man-made rules, and when those other people don't follow those rules, they judge them and decide that they're sinful. When the rules were just made, by, made up by a human being in the first place. The other day, Bonnie and I were driving around town and we were behind a car that was going constantly five miles an hour below the speed limit. If the speed limit was 25, they were going 20. If the speed limit was 35, they were going 30. By the way, if any of you were the driver of that car, I apologize um, that I'm talking about you without realizing it. But as I considered this driver's behavior, I just wondered if that person, if their thought process was something like this. If limiting my speed keeps me safe, what if I limit my speed a little more? Won't that keep me extra safe? And won't that keep the tailgating idiot behind me safe as well? Well, I don't know if going five miles under the speed limit will keep any of us extra safe, but it sure gave me an opportunity to learn extra patience. We sometimes look at people who display a devout, hyper-holy, rule-keeping attitude as super spiritual. Even if we find such people a bit scary at times, we admire their commitment to what they believe. But Paul tells us that people who are devoted to their own rules actually do so out of an unspiritual mind. Despite their devout appearance, they may not be spiritual at all. Especially when they judge others. Especially when their pious attitude is nothing but false humility. Humility. And especially when a bunch of rules replaces a living, vital relationship with God. Some of us are old enough to remember a few rules that used to be very common. 
but are pretty much ignored today. Rules like these, good Christians don't go to movies. Good Christians don't play cards. Good Christians don't dance. Good Christians don't drink alcohol. Funny, movies aren't mentioned anywhere in scripture. Playing cards aren't mentioned anywhere in scripture either. Dancing is mentioned in scripture, but where it's mentioned, the Bible pretty much says to go ahead and do it. And Pastor Ryan already mentioned a couple weeks ago that the Bible does not outright forbid drinking of alcohol. What scripture does warn us against are things like lust and idleness and drunkenness. If the Lord is leading us to put some guidelines in place to help us have boundaries against temptations like these, that can be a good thing. That can be part of following the Holy Spirit's leading in our day-to-day -day lives. But when we lose sight of the reason we're following those rules, when we follow those rules for rules' sake, when we inflict our own rules on other people, we have crossed the line from being spiritual to being unspiritual. We have crossed the line by being led by this, from being led by the Spirit to being led by the flesh. And we have crossed the line from life in Christ to life under the law. Paul says in verse 23 that such rules and regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility, and their harsh treatment of the body. But they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. So the very things these rules are meant to control, they don't control. Human rules don't get us closer to godly living. They don't ultimately keep us from sin because we end up breaking them anyway. Human rules are broken by humans because they're rules kept only by human strength. And human strength without the Lord is frail and flawed. But I've talked about rules here way too much. What I really want to talk about is the better way the way of freedom in Christ. Now, for some of us, freedom in Christ might sound dangerous, scary. Does freedom in Christ mean I get to do anything I want? Even if it's something illegal? Can that really be good for me, freedom, that kind of freedom? As I mentioned before, the Apostle Paul has a lot to say about freedom in Christ throughout his letters. In much of his teaching, just like right here in Colossians 2, Paul instructs us by telling us what freedom is not. Let me give you some examples. Freedom is not a license to sin. Romans 6.6 6 says, What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Paul also tells us that freedom is not getting to do whatever we want, whether it's good for us or not. He tells us in 1 Corinthians 10, 23, I have the right to do anything, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but not everything is constructive. In addition, Paul emphasizes that freedom is not getting to do things that, regard, that disregard the needs of others. Galatians 5, 13 and 14 says, You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. Finally, on this day of celebration of our nation, it's important to remember that Freedom is not permission to break the laws of the land. We know this because Paul's compelling chapter on Christian freedom, one of the most compelling teachings on freedom that he gives in Romans 14, is preceded by an equally compelling chapter about submitting to governor, governing authorities 
in chapter 13. So we've heard a lot about, free, about what freedom in Christ isn't. What is it then? Paul indicates that the freedom that Christ invites us to is, first of all, a spirit-led kind of freedom. We're free to respond to God's spirit working in us, even while we are empowered by that same spirit working in us. The spirit shows us what, what to do and then gives us the strength to do it. This is such a contrast to the unspiritual religion Paul talks about in Colossians chapter 2. Second, the freedom that Christ invites us to is also available to us because we are not under the law, but under grace. The Christian life is not meant to be primarily a sin management program, as Dallas Willard used to put it. A sin management program. That sounds awful. But we often live as if that's what Christian life is. What a dour, dull kind of Christianity that becomes if rule keeping is all our faith is about. But Paul gives us a glimpse here in Colossians 2 how the abundant life Christ calls us to is not a life of rules. It's a life of grace. And by God's grace, we are all free from all those human religious rules. Finally, the freedom Christ gives us, the freedom that Christ invites us to, flows out of our relationship with him. Our Savior who redeemed us and set us free by his death and resurrection. In verse 19, Paul talks about how Christ is the head from whom the whole body, supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows as God causes it to grow. I want to back up to earlier in the chapter and read what Paul says there. Beginning with verse 6, he says, So then, just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world, rather than on Christ. For in Christ, all the fullness of deity lives in bodily form, and in Christ, you have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. Don't you see? In Christ, we have access to the power and authority of the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. When we access that power and authority through our relationship with Christ, rules are no longer needed. We no longer follow a rule book. We just follow. Period. And that, my sisters and brothers, is why we know we can walk in freedom. Because we walk with the Lord. And the Lord walks with us. Amen. Amen.